let's move right into our next presentation from Mocambarota. I knew I was gonna do that. Mocambarero, Carl Moropa, Zimbabwe, all for one, one for all, combating genocide and Africa's culture of violence. Moropa is a lawyer and development practitioner based in Zimbabwe. Mumroba worked for Section 7 Zimbabwe, a startup nonprofit youth-led organization specializing in disruptive human rights advocacy around constitutional law and constitutionalism. He has experience in human rights programming and multidisciplinary legal research on the lived realities of remote communities across Zimbabwe. Moropa is passionate about community development and development finance. Again, let's welcome Dr. Maropa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. All right, great. Um, you can just share the presentation <clears throat> while I introduce myself. Uh, thank you so much, actually, for that wonderful introduction. I'll just add that I know my name has got five syllables, so feel free to chop it up whenever, wherever you want to do so. Um, it's, it's such a pleasure and an honor for me to be present, though virtually, um, in this very really wonderful event. This conference really brings to light some of the challenges we are facing in Africa. And um, I am from Zimbabwe, but I do understand the context in several countries where genocide is the reality, and also in Zimbabwe, although maybe many narratives don't actually present it as that. Um, so I'm really honored to be sharing the story of Zimbabwe. Um, and maybe some of the genocide that maybe people were never aware of. Um, so I just have about seven, eight slides that I want to share with you to did um, title awful one for all culture of violence. So if you notice that there, there are two key areas that I'm going to be highlighting today, the notion of genocide and also the culture of violence that we do have in Africa and Zimbabwe predominantly, which has led us to, you know, be having this conversation here today. Well, of course, uh, even if you can move to the next slide, please, where I just give my table of contents with regards to my presentation. So I'm going to, of course, focus on this particular area. I'll highlight violence. I'll then move on to highlight genocide. Um, some of the criminal and the social historical motivations for genocide within Zimbabwe, um, even the genocidal skeleton that I'm going to be using. And then I'll, I'll proceed to talk about some of the preventative measures that we can take um, as a country, as a continent, as a whole, um, to try and see how we can address this problem um, of genocide. But with regards to my topic, um, you'll notice that it sounds very heroic. Um, and it rightfully so, all for one, one for all. It's a very common statement, um, but I actually took it from a very interesting source. Uh, I don't know if I should call it that, but uh, you can be the judge of that. So there's an interesting um, Japanese uh, series, or it's an anime uh, called uh, My Hero Academia, where there's a main character who possesses a superpower um, called all, one for all. And surprisingly, that is also juxtaposed with the main villain who happens to have the power all for one. Um, so I just found that to be quite interesting and in trying to make some sense within the context of the series. But I also found that it. it even a story of genocide. So inspiration does how people move, how people think. And it also, it, it also talks about things that I talk about um, within this paper, but also within the work that I do around constitutionalism. It's where we try to marry how people live, what people do versus what the law says. And I believe that's what this paper is also going to address. So feel free to move on to the next slide as we begin. Now, uh, when we're dealing with violence, um, and you forgive me for having very plain and minimalist slides, um, but I feel as if violence is a precursor to genocide. We've often heard that genocide itself um, sort of starts off in one way and then develops into another. 
Um, but I want to sort of deconstruct some of those notions based on what I've seen within the country and why genocide is, is also is both complex but also quite simple to try and trace out. So what we see is that when we have a culture of violence that pervades a society, that violence often transforms into other things, and in this case, genocide. So violence is then the preconditioning um, that creates situations where violence can happen, so uh, where, where genocide could happen. So it's not that genocide is just possible in certain societies like Zimbabwe. It then becomes very probable. So violence has its deeply embedded socially accepted norms. By that, I mean, if we were to look at the Zimbabwean society, violence is entrenched at every single stage of one's development. Within primary schools and high schools, we're talking about violence being used um, to reinforce discipline. We're seeing violence being perpetrated by teachers on students. We're seeing violence even within the home where it's now clouded under this notion of love. Violence is viewed as love within the African context, where we have um, parents using the rod, using whatever use of uh, corporal punishment to discipline their children in the hope that they grow up in the way that they should go, of course, basing that on some Christian tenets. We look at violence in marriages, where wives are often beaten. Physical abuse um, is so rife within Zimbabwe's uh, the context we see so much of this uh, when we're doing some of the work we're doing around constitutionalism and talking to people about domestic violence. This is something that we experience so often. Uh, in actual fact, the Afrobarometer studies estimate that um, one in every three women aged between 15 to 49 has experienced physical violence, which is an alarming statistic if we're considering what violence can do and what it can cause in the future. So we do have violence as something that creates just a fertile ground for anything to erupt. And in this case, we're going to then see how violence can also create a situation of genocide or can sow the seed for genocidal intent. You may move to the next slide. Now, within the next slide, I'm going to be readdressing genocide. And the reason why I'm talking about genocide in Zimbabwe in the year 1983 to 1987, we experienced a genocide that was called Gukurahundi. Um, so the Gukurahundi genocide was perpetrated by our former president, President Robert Mugabe, which was targeted at the Debele folk, um, which reside in the northern part of the country. Now, the reason why this is a genocide, in my view, is because it actually qualifies under the genocide convention. Um, but of course, due to suppression, due to even the repression of the media, this has not been tabled as an actual genocide. Um, several scholars actually say it was an attempted genocide, or because the, the question of intent was never really asked at an international level. We actually have reports that in 1999, um, when Joshua Nkomo, um, one of the leaders of the Nebele clan, when they passed on, this was after um, a unity accord was signed between the two warring factions. Uh, former President Robert Mugabe was noted to have said that it was a moment of madness, and he is never said to have repeated such a statement. It only happened at, his, at the funeral of Joshua Nkomo, and it just shows just how much the genocide has been kept under wraps. No one talks about it. And this is several years after such a genocide, which claimed the lives of over 80,000 people. But no one seems to have tabled it as a genocide. We only hear um, inferences to it as a time was a dark time within Zimbabwe's past, but nothing more to really concretize the fact that this occurred as a result of ethnic difference. So when we're looking at the legal framework that uh, defines genocide, we obviously go to the Genocide Convention, um, of course, going into Article 2, which then defines what genocide is and its many forms, um, whether it's through killings, whether it's about creating a situation that can cause such harm, whether it's about um, displacing children, um, in any way and form that genocide finds itself, there's always a resort to, I guess, a motivation. There's some preconditioning that makes it more probable in, in specific societies. Now, if we also look at uh, genocide, the elements, of course, there is intent being one of the main elements for genocide. And this intent is seen in, in the way that it is planned. It is also seen in things such as 
you know, what, what statements were said, what measures were put in place to carry out the violence. Now, if we also look at um, the context, um, the context is also defined within the convention to mean creating situations that sort of lead up to the genocide itself and not necessarily the characterization of genocide um, in all these other spaces. Now, can I, you can go to the next slide. Now, I want to also make a, a distinction between the criminal nature of genocide versus its social historical uh, nature. So the criminal side is obviously referenced by the Rome Statute, even what the, the Genocide Convention says. But we also need to understand that for any genocide to take place, there is a historical motivation. There is a social inclination for such a genocide to take place. And some of these social um, considerations or historical considerations include suspicion, they include hate, they include self-righteousness. And I reference these three in particular because when we look at the genocide that occurred in Zimbabwe, all these three things show themselves. We hear um, several reports um, within some of the work we're doing to, to sort of look at this genocide to say, uh, during the time of Robert Mugabe, after um, the fight for independence, which happened in 1980, then moving into the time when this genocide happened in 1983, we noticed that President Robert Mugabe had a desire to lead the state as a one-party state where he was uh, the lifelong president. But of course, this could not be because when they fought the war for liberation, they fought alongside the Ndebele people, which also had their own political party, which was already a faction on its own because it's its, its own separate ethnic group. Now, Robert Mugabe was leading the Shona clan um, and Joshua Nkomo was leading the Ndebele clan. But the Ndebele clan was far outnumbered and Robert Mugabe was the one who was leading the government at the time, especially post-independence. So we see that he always had a desire to lead uh, by, of course, removing the Ndebele clan from leadership because they also played a part in the liberation and by extension required some sort of compensation in terms of political power. Now, if we're looking at the suspicion that was now being raised among the Shona societies to say the Ndebele's were the ones who actually caused us to be colonized in the first place. You know, there's a conflation of history, um, you know, facts that are not really said in the way that they should be. Um, it was even called an epistemicide um, of some sort where knowledge, truth, facts were convoluted in a way that portrayed the Ndebele people as the other group that was not supposed to lead or have legitimacy in terms of power. So these suspicions, this hate, this self-righteousness to see the Shona people as being far superior than Ndebele people is transferred. There's a generational transfer of these perspectives, which then feed into the culture of violence that we addressed to begin with which then causes a situation or creates a conducive environment or an enabling environment that makes violence such as genocide that much more likely. So there is the pursuit of legitimacy and autonomy, which is more, uh, more critically defined as self-determination, which was of course being experienced within the Shona setting, within the Shona society. But this then transforms itself by saying, okay, fine, if we want to, um, to be autonomous, if we want to entrench our legitimacy, how do we do so? The next uh, answer would be, we must expel uh, the Ndebele clan. So violence then seen as the ultimate weapon of choice, because as we, as, as we have mentioned before, violence has always been inculcated within the culture of the people in Zimbabwe from a very tender age, when people go to school, in the homes, in the church, in the marriages, in the workplace, and even the law and order system that we carry entrenches violence and corporal punishment. You may go to the next slide. So now, we, now what we have is a situation where genocide is probable. So, in my view, genocide occurs when there's a spot, when there's a particular skeleton. And I'm using the term skeleton because if we were to put these things into motion, they do function as a skeleton as we know it. So there are three things that occur during a genocide. You need one, incensed actors. Two, you need 
flawed perspectives, and three, you need the material means. And if we were to put these things in the form of a skeleton, um, just to create an analogy, the instant actors are controlling the ideology. They are spreading the rumor of dissent. They are spreading the message of distrust. They are also spreading the suspicion. And you only need one instant actor. And that's when I go back to that title saying all for one or one for all. One person can represent the views of an entire clan. And if that one person is convincing enough, they can rally so many more people to do the work um, of destroying and decimating other ethnic groups. So you require an incensed actor, incensed actors. And in this case, we had Robert Mugabe, who was already a viable option to perpetrate the ideology that the Ndebele people could not stand beside him when it was time to declare him the ultimate leader. This was obviously his way of consolidating power, but it required him to spread a certain rhetoric that could cause division among the Shona people and the Ndebele people. The second thing would, would of course be the flawed perspectives. The fact that they viewed the, 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 the Ndebele people as being the ones who caused um, the harm in the first place during the negotiations with the early settlers within the country, they were done within the Ndebele region. And of course, this then led to how we were colonized. But this is not the full truth. Colonization took such a big stance within the country. And it was been, it's a bit naive to then think that one person or one clan caused the entire country um, to be subjugated to, um, to colonial rule. And thirdly, the material means. We're looking at state resources. We're looking at um, state machinery that can enable such a widespread destruction of people. We're looking at propaganda being, uh, being disseminated through state media. Even up to now within the country, uh, the ruling party, which happens to be the one that Robin Mugabe was still under, is the one that controls state media. Um, the Fourth Republic is entirely within their control. And you cannot post anything, even about constitutionalism, um, on state media, state radios, on the television, if it does not um, suffice with the words that they want. Um, you can move on to the next slide. But these are the three things um, that pervade any genocide. And this was the case uh, within the Zimbabwean context. Now, given that we now know what genocide looks like, what genocide could look like when you have your instance actors, when you've got the perspectives that are being flouted around, and you have the material means to disseminate um, the false knowledge and, and also to carry out the, the act of killing, of destroying, of othering. We then need to find out how we can then combat genocide when we can, especially within times like this, uh, in conferences like this that give us awareness on how best to deal with genocide. The question that arises is who has an obligation to prevent genocide? When we are dealing with societies that are as communal as Zimbabwe, when we're dealing with societies that rely on customary law um, running parallel to general law, when we're dealing with societies that are formed by several ethnic groups, um, these could be potentially divisive states. Um, but we definitely see uh, a pattern where you have got communal states that require on the spirit of Ubuntu as keeping people together. And then you're adding violence to such a, to such a society as the be all and end all uh, for matters that arise. How do we then prevent genocide? Who actually has the obligation, especially within these modern times? So there is a convergence between law and society. The laws that have been put in place to deter harm, the laws that have been put in place to ensure people live together peacefully. Um, even the preamble within the Zimbabwean constitution says we are united in our diversity, which seems uh, very easy to understand from a superficial perspective, but it carries certain complexities when we're dealing with such a past, a past that even up to today has not been addressed, the past of the genocide that occurred that we up to today never talk about within schools. There is no memorialization of it. There is no commemoration of it. There's no remembrance. It happened and we have forgotten about it. There is, of course, uh, state, uh, state institutions such as the National Peace and Reconciliation Commission, which was set up in the hopes of trying to mend the, the of course, the, the severed relations between the Ndebele and the Shona people. But they have not been able to do much work because most of the time, the government does not want the Kukurawundi genocide to actually be brought up. 
because of how divisive it could be. So the question will always stand, who has the obligation? And I believe that there are three ways of approaching this, which is my tripartite approach to obligations. It's not that the obligation is placed only on state. It's that these obligations are mutually inclusive. They work together, they're indivisible, where the state has its obligations, the people have their obligations, and then we also have personal obligations um, to the people and to the state by extension. So they all work together in this cyclical wheel so that one action is, is of course, encouraged by the other, and it's also buttressed by another. And that's why it's in the form of a wheel. So when we're looking at state obligations, we just go to um, the conventions that are in existence, your um, genocide convention, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which obviously talks about the need for states to protect, um, to promote and respect human rights, and of course not to engage in acts of genocide or ethnic cleansing. Um, we're also looking at the obligations, the Pan-African obligation to say when genocide is occurring in one country, it should also be um, attended to by other countries or international international help. So those form part of state obligations. A state has obligations to protect its people from themselves. Um, and it's also something that the state should take a big part in doing. We've got people obligations. And I'm saying people obligations because we do run uh, a parallel system of law where we have general law and customary law which has for so long brought the people of Zimbabwe together. We also, we also see this in the notion of Ubuntu. This is the realization that I am because we are. And that is a very powerful element within the Zimbabwean context, because it does take a village to raise a child, and one person's battles, these are the battles of everyone. And in the same vein, when an entire clan is being attacked, we can all impute that, 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 that battle is also being fought by that one person. Uh, of course, the, the situation works and vice versa. So people have obligations to their neighbors, and these, this means even to their clans. We have a system of chiefs, um, which we always encourage for them to work hand in hand um, in terms of agriculture, in terms of economy, um, social cohesion. Um, there is need for people, and by that I mean even different ethnicities, to realize that they are because the other ones are there. We're all forming um, the Zimbabwean people, the moral fabric or the societal fabric that is Zimbabwe. This is done by people. And we need to understand that we also have personal obligations. The realization that someone in the Ndebele clan is just like me in the Shona clan and vice versa. And these are things that we also, also encourage uh, when we're looking at how do we adopt a new mindset at a personal level to understand that the duty not to inflict harm on my neighbor is my own. And how can I also teach that duty to the next person, to my offspring? How can I remove the culture of violence and replace that with more fundamental norms of, you know, of creating, of creating family, of creating um, the safety net for others without relying on division, without relying on othering. And these are some of the personal obligations. With regards to personal obligations, it's good for us to even ask, what does the next person want? Because when it comes to genocide, there's always a fundamental reason, possibly it being passed down, but there is a fundamental reason why the incensed actor rallies the state tools or rallies whatever tools that they have to inflict harm on a separate group of people. So when we begin to understand that we do have personal obligations that feed into the obligations of a people, which also feed into the obligations of a state, trying to create this horizontal relationship as opposed to a vertical one. We can be able to, to, to demystify this notion of othering. We can be able to destroy the factions that exist, which in actual fact do not exist on the ground. These are machinations created within the minds of the incensed actors who then use or disseminate uh, misleading perspectives and ensure that the state resources or the resources available to them can be used for the destruction. Um, so this tripartite approach works in a cyclical name. An area is depend not one area um, stands alone, but all of them are codependent. Um, you may move on to the next slide. Um, um, to leave a couple of minutes for questions, um, you have like three more minutes to present, and then that leaves about four or five minutes for questions. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, that's fine. Um, 
You can go to the next slide. Yes, Dan, can you hear me? You can move on to the next slide. Oh, thank you. This, yeah, it's just my concluding slide, but it's just to entrench this, this ethos of saying one person can represent an entire community and vice versa. And so it's important for us to realize that even though there are legal frameworks that can safeguard um, communities or people or ethnicities from genocide, we also need to work on the human psyche. We also need to look at our societies and how they're constituted. We also need to sort of start questioning the method that we have been using for years. Is violence really the answer? Is it something we can do away with? Is it something we can replace? And above all, is it something that can run alongside um, how we view our societies to be like in the future? I think when we ask these questions about law and society, we can begin to see that there could be a way forward in combating, vi in combating violence that obviously leads to genocide by trying to understand how our societies are constituted. And with those words, I thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. That was amazing, that was great. Thank you so much for your presentation. So we have a couple minutes for questions. <laughs> okay. Questions, so we'll go here and then I'll come here. We have three questions, we'll start here, thank you. First, let me congratulate you. That is the best description I've had. It just fell right in my soul. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned the violence that we have at home, in schools, et cetera, and then you talk about Ubuntu. So my question is, how do a people who know Ubuntu end up being so violent at home? Was this since colonization or was this existing before? So uh, Ubuntu, how it works is that it's the realization that communities are more connected than we think. There is no individual um, within the group. So within the African context, and specifically the Zimbabwean one, the we is greater than the I. But what that means, or what that tells us is that I have a duty to my neighbor, and my neighbor has a duty to me, but that does not remove the aspect of violence. So violence is so pervasive within Zimbabwean communities. Violence is everywhere. We can tell you, I mean, if you ask anyone in the country, they've all been raised by the stick. We've seen it in our homes. A parent will tell you, I am beating you because I love you and will proceed to administer the beating. We see that in schools. Parents will go to schools and tell the teacher, I'm bringing my son into the class. I'm bringing my daughter into the class. If he is a problem in any way, I am giving you the permission to beat them. We also see this in the church, where, where people are relying on biblical terms of saying, spare the rod, spoil the child. It is the teaching that is encouraged. We go into marriages. Wives are beaten by their husbands because there is the cultural belief that a, a man will protect his woman. A man will discipline the one he loves. We also then go into workplaces that even use violence as a way of, uh, of rising up the ladder. Whoever seems more more competent, uh, maybe in a physical sense, is the one who gets to the top. It's in every single layer of the Zimbabwean society. And it's unfortunate that that's how it has been. But Ubuntu sort of covers all of that with, this, with the thinking that I am because you are and I protect um, that which belongs to the community, that which belongs to my community. Um, so violence finds its place even in those kind of settings. But can I, can I, I, I just, I, I hear all of that but I want to know when did the violence start? Because you mentioned in church, so that means Christianity and the missionaries. You're mentioning, you know, these other things. So is it since colonization? Because it's such a conflict, right? Is that, is that, yes. I want to know yes, when it's a big... So is it colonization? You mentioned school, so it wasn't going to schools until they came, right? So it seemed like yes. it's colonization that has instilled this violence in the people. I believe that colonization sort of came and rode with a, a flow that was already there. The culture of violence has always been within Zimbabwean communities. Um, even the way in which we conducted in wars back in the day, even the way in which communities were raised, violence was always part and parcel of the story. So when religion came in through colonization, it just sort of attached to an ideal that was always entrenched within the people in Africa and of course in Zimbabwe. And that's why it's so pervasive within most of African communities. 
I'm sure Safa even hinted on it when she was making a presentation. There is always this, this aspect of violence. Um, if you were present yesterday, um, the ladies who were who taught to Burundi mentioned this a scenario of saying, you know, one of the one of the mothers sort of hackled their children on the ear. It's, violence has always been within the African context, um, but Christianity, the churches, schools, they also came and reinforced what was already existing. And that's why we sort of have it manifesting into different forms in modern times. Right. Um, thank you for a very thought-provoking presentation, really. I appreciate it. But uh, with the prior sentence, especially your response to the question, I completely agree to disagree with that. You know, it's a conference. That's the thing. We can agree to disagree on various things. And that's, I think, the beauty of the academia. Um, this is my synthesis. In a culture that wears, leaves, and breathes Ubuntu, the sense of community, I don't think violence is the culture. But that is what I really believe. And you, you were definitely describing how violence is really inculcated in schools and stuff. And whenever I hear that, it's about, you know, um, in so many sentences, we talk about how colonization went hand in hand with Christianity, went hand in hand with capitalism. Uh, they kind of fit each other, especially in the African context. Um, and what I see is that the influence of the boarding school, right? The Catholic church or other church missionaries come to Africa with boarding schools. And boarding schools are not places where uh, parents definitely were very happy to give their children to. So the discipline and everything and everything was part of that. And the thing is, colonization has been in Africa for a long, long time. And all it was was cultural violence was colonization for me. I'm not saying that Africans that were very peaceful people. I'm not saying that either. But I don't think that um, we should use cultural violence to attribute to Africa or Africans. Uh, because it's definitely a country that has Ubuntu, that has, and it, and it's in every single country, in all the 54 countries. Uh, so yeah, and it's always, yeah, and that's the thing. And we definitely, as scholars, we always do that. <laughs> and it kind of pains me. So that is why I agree to disagree. And yes. So I, I will let it be for now because I could talk about this the whole day. And Dr. Bithias. Yeah, we should probably have a conference just addressing that. Thank you. Uh, thank um, you, you can I just respond to that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can go ahead. Hello? Yes, you may respond. Can you hear us? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that view. I, I agree to say it, it's hard to conceive um, Ubuntu as being synonymous with violence. But what, what, I've, what I've seen, I guess, from, from the Zimbabwean context is that we don't say I'm going to commit violence um, in the word violence. This, because it's, it's embedded in how we live and we move. If violence is seen as love, um, then it then ceases to have the meaning of the word violence. If violence is seen as discipline, it then ceases to to be communicated as such. Because no one, no one on the ground would ever say Zimbabwe is a violent has a violent culture. No one would ever agree to that. But we're just calling it what it is, um, because our Ubuntu is more about this collective sense of you. It's about belonging, but Ubuntu doesn't take into account the way in which um, that, that, that upbringing is done. I mean, that's why we then use the word violence, because if someone is going to resort to corporal punishment, we cannot run away from, the, from that terminology. But I do understand 
um, that it's, it is difficult to conceptualize Ubuntu in the context of violence. But if someone is claiming love and if someone is claiming discipline as a result of that, right. um, or using that before saying violence, then it could be a very different situation. Right. We have a but, couple of um, comments in a couple of minutes. I'm going to let the other people yeah. have their Sure. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, wonderful lecture. I think uh, what the last speaker was quarreling with is the expression culture of violence, which um, uh, we, uh, I would like to dis uh, challenge. Uh, I don't think any particular culture has this culture of violence, but you are correct in saying that every culture, wherever there are humans, there are elements of violence. And it's our duty to uh, fight uh, that violence. But Africa has no culture of violence. So uh, my, my question um, is, um, it's, um, I'm happy that you qualified Gukura Hundi as uh, genocide. Many of us intellectuals uh, in the West uh, uh, who regarded Mugabe as an anti-colonial hero are still reluctant to accept uh, that our hero could uh, kill uh, fellow Africans. So um, my, uh, I would like to uh, have you comment on um, Mugabe's use of anti-imperialist rhetoric as, a, as a, a, a way to conceal his hatred of um, fellow Afri uh, Africans of uh, different ethnicity. And uh, the second part of my comment or my question is, um, could you comment, you, you, you talked about the tripartite uh, form of um, obligations. Do you see uh, the, the, that uh, the, the Shona intellectuals and the Ndebele intellectuals, that is Zimbabwe intellectuals, do they um, perceive themselves as obliged to um, basically um, defeat or prevent genocide in Zimbabwe? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, if I may start with your second question, um, to say, I'm going to um, say this you... quickly, consolidate very quickly because our time is up okay. and we have one more. Okay, cool. um, so with regards to genocide and the work, I, I guess the intellectuals, they, they may also see their role as being one that um, has to do with maybe providing literature um, that of course gives people disinference to say that we all have a duty to play. But the literature is, of course, hinged on Ubuntu, and not necessarily to say it's hinged on anything else that may be outside of that, because Ubuntu is something that we believe ties all of us, either to the state or to the people, or even as persons. Um, but I think when it comes to, to the intellectuals within the country, besides doing the aspect of writing, many of them um, don't act actively show um, that they also have a part to play within the genocide narrative, because it's very suppressed. Even up to now, as I was saying, we have a National Peace and Reconciliation Commission, able-bodied men and women um, who sit on this commission, who have, up to today, not given a single report on the Gukurahundi incidents. Um, that is compelling enough, or at least that brings people to, 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 to declare it as such. And the second question has to do with uh, former President Robert Mugabe. Um, so his rhetoric was about indigenization. And when you look at how he orchestrated the Kukurahundi genocide, he focused more on saying um, there is a need for one party state and I am the best person to lead it. That was the first line of argument. Secondly, it was about the guilt of, or at least the responsibility for causing, responsibility for causing the, um, the, colonial, the colonialization in the first place, which was imputed on the Ndebele people. So it was about responsibility. It was about him declaring himself as the most able leader to lead the new regime. And of course, we, we don't even need to talk about his own personal motivations as to being someone who genuinely wanted to be in that position of power. So I think that's how he was able to mask, um, you know, the divide and maybe the-, the right, Thank the, you, we're the, gonna um, add this last thank comment you. to the conversation, okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I think it's more helpful to talk about subcultural violence and that in our understanding, we define cultures in ways that are essentializing and that's part of the problem, right? Yeah. Uh, Africa has 55 countries, counting the Western Sahara, 1,300 languages and about 3,500 ethnic groups, not tribes, ethnic groups. 
And so when we talk about uh, culture, we're, we're essentializing, but culture is a system of beliefs that is transmitted across generations. And colonialism transmitted a, uh, a notion of state violence, right? What's one of the primary reasons of the state's existence? The strategic manipulation of symbols. And so when we talk about violence, we have to also be clear that it's not only physical. There is epistemic violence, philosophical, ideational, and poverty as economic violence. So I think it, it behooves us to move away from essentializing. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation.